Now we are on. Yes. Okay. So good evening, everyone, and good morning to Buenos Aires. I have to say here it's going to be uh, dark. But first of all, we have some technical details. As you have seen, the talk will be recorded and presented later on on the Weber Scholars Network's website. And I ask all participants to share their pictures so that we can see each other as if we were in a real discussion this evening. And it would be good if all participants mute their microphones and only the speaker opens the microphone. So I think it's better for understanding. Yes, here we go. Good evening on behalf of the Weber Scholars Network. My name is Edith Hanke and Victor invited me to moderate today's discussion. Octavio Machul will present an aspect of his doctoral thesis on Weber and Nietzsche, and afterwards, Christian Marti and Camilla Emmenegger will present their views on the connection or linkage or whatever it is between Friedrich Nietzsche and Max Weber. Octavio will then comment on both statements before we open the talk for questions and commands of all participants. So Octavio Mahul, he is a lecturer and researcher at the Gino Dermani Research Institute of the University of Buenos Aires. And in, 19, uh, in 2019, he presented his master thesis on, and now I quote the title in English and not in Spanish, the influence of Friedrich Nietzsche on the political thought of Max Weber between 1892 and 1898. And at the moment he is preparing his PhD in social science. And by the way, I'm sitting here in front of the Max Weber Gesamtausgabe. <laughs> um, it's the Weber Library and Special Collection at the Bavarian Academy of Science and Humanities in Munich. And this room or this library is the linkage between the three participants um, today because Christian and Camilla prepared their doctoral thesis here for several times and months. And Octavio also liked to come here, but as so often, often in the last time, the pandemic made it impossible for him to come to Germany. And so there is a linkage between the three, the three um, speakers of this evening. Welcome to you. And now it's up to you, Octavio. You want to challenge us with the provocative question, was Max Weber a Nietzschean? You have the floor. Thank you, Edit. Uh, first of all, I want to say that for me, it's an honor, honor being here. I, uh, when I see the names that are here in order to hear me, for me, it's like a, a tonishing. Uh, I think that it's something that it's a uh, way I, I'm seeing myself in, in the mirror and I don't want it. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, First, thanks to Victor who invited me to write first the, the text that is in the Max Weber Scholars website, to Brenda who has uh, made the technical support and to the uh, human support for this meeting, uh, to Edith whose generosity with me is so important for my investigation and I hope one day I could pay her back. Um, and obviously to Christian and Camille who agreed to discuss my text. Uh, this, what I, I will read what I wrote to in, for the Max Weber Scholar website because I think it's more fair to Camille and, and Christian uh, not uh, see me improvisating, improvisating in English and saying whatever thing. And then uh, I will please to hear them uh, 
their opinion. So first, I want to say a little bit how I reached this problem of Nietzsche's, of Max Weber Nietzscheanism or Nietzsche influence in Max Weber, that uh, like most of most important decisions in my life, there was by absolute chance, it was casualty. I was in my last year of the bachelor degree of political science, reading in an investigation group, the political writings of Max Weber and uh, reading um, the Sorry, we can't hear Octavio anymore. He's I was muted. muted. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. I don't know where I stopped. So uh, I was saying that I reached the problem of Max Weber Nietzscheanism or Nietzsche influence in Max Weber by absolute chance when I was at the same time reading the national state and the um, economic policy, the inaugural address of 1895 in a research group uh, about Max Weber political writings. And I was in my last year of the um, degree in an optative subject, subject called The Adventures of Western Marxism, reading the second on time limitation of Nietzsche. And at that time, I was really surprised and astonished when I find what for me was my first and only a scientific finding that I felt like Einstein in that moment, that uh, Weber used some words and some concepts in the exact way that I saw it in the second on Chamberlain meditation. And I had like in one second, the intuition that I was in Max Weber's head. I was young and I was very uh, full of illusions. <laughs> So I began then a, a research about Max Weber and Nietzsche. And I, I, I tried to read all what was wrote, written about that. It was not easy to get access to all, but uh, in the way I found one another time that most of this uh, research, perhaps they have a lack of methodological inquiries around what is a, a influence relation. A lot of times, from my opinion, I saw like subjective findings of uh, identities between some of the part of the thought of Max Weber and some of the way that Nietzsche uh, works in his problems. So around these problems, one, the question of perhaps a more methodological one, how to study influence, and then the question of the influence of Nietzsche in Max Weber, uh, are what stimulated the, the text that I write and I'm now going to read. Was Max Weber an Eastian? Does this question formulated in this way even make any sense? Under what concept of Nietzscheanism will we make such an evaluation? From our interpretation of Nietzsche's work and its respective, respective affinity with that of Max Weber, from the multiple and different readings of Nietzsche that were carried out in Weber's time, from Weber's own readings of him, what readings would this be? Which Weber even are we calling Nietzschean or not? All of his work or a specific period? These questions burden on an issue that in the history of thought has generated its fair share of controversy. The problem of influence. Is it possible to assert if an author influenced another and if it's possible, what is the scope of such an identification? Or better, what is the point of an investigation of these traits? The question of influence acquired an ambiguous status towards the end of the 20th century. While on the one hand, the concept was discarded because it all too easily developed into a metaphysical form of the history, of thought or a mythology of history in the works of Kenton Skinner. On the other, it has been reintroduced whether in quotation marks or replaced by a less troublesome equivalent. 
footprint, trace, and even elective affinity, the Goethe rooted concept that Weber himself employs, appear thus many times as ways of insinuating some kind of relationship between two thinkers. But ambiguity is not a friend of intellectual probity. If you are going to make a statement, we must be as explicit as possible so as to give opportunity for criticism and discussion. Crucially, denying the possibility that an author has influenced another is the equally metaphysical reverse of the obsession to find an influence the gateway to the ultimate core of an influenced author. For starters, the question of Nietzsche influence on Weber must be separated from the question of Weber Nietzscheanism. While the latter is more akin to inquiring on the adoption of a religious creed, the first aims to clarify the way in which thought develops historically. That is the procedure I shall adopt here. It implies raising questions such as, at what point was Weber confronted with Nietzsche writings? How did Nietzsche circulate in the discursive communities close to Weber in his time? In relation to what problem in his work does Weber approach the text of Orff or about Nietzsche? Again, all these questions clearly point in one direction. The need to historize and trace a specific instance of that relationship of influence rather than comparing across their entire output the fundamental problems that the two supposedly address in similar or inter interrelated ways. In that sense, I would like to specifically discuss this problem from the arc that is established between two of the initial instances in which Nietzsche is referred to in Max Weber's work. The first one, not necessarily chronologically, take us to 1896, to the founding of the National Socialist Verein, the National Social Association. In this occasion, Weber made a devastating critique of Christian and pacifist perspective on political life and called the public to recognize that choosing a dedication to politics meant accepting the eternal and inevitable struggle between human beings. In a challenge to his contemporaries, Weber closed his speech by invoking an old Thuringian expression, Landgraf get tough, in, Deutsch, in German, sorry, bear the heart, an interpolation almost identical to the one that Nietzsche had made in the section, The Old and New Tablets, of the third book of Du Spock Zarathustra. In this passage of the work, after criticizing the weak as decadent and praising the toughness that all creation needs, Nietzsche affirms, this new child I place, my brothers, on your heads. Harden yourself, bear that heart. Not coincidentally, after Weber's intervention, the Christian journalist and politician Helmut von Gerlach took the floor addressing Weber and stated, I'm not going to accompany the Nietzschean master morality, Nietzsche Herren Moral, in politics. There is no need to say Landgraf get tough, but Landgraf be merciful. If Gerlach's Gerlach accusation that Weber subscribed to a Nietzschean master morality seems to support the predominant hypothesis about Nietzsche-Weber relationship, that is, suggesting their proximity, the publication in uh, 2020 of the last volume of the Gesamtausgabe, that is, Praktische Nationale Ökonomie for Lesungen, oh, the years I can say it in German, uh, that uh, they are the lectures that Weber gave between 1895 and 1999, between the University of Freiburg and Heidelberg. This material, this last volume, bring us new data. Because in the chapter dedicated to political economic ideas, which also encompasses contemporary debates, debates Weber, Weber identified social Darwinist position that frame free competition in terms of a form of selection of the strongest, as a form of socio-political Nietzscheanism. There, so Max Weber identified the name of Nietzsche with a trend of political ideas with which he was against social Darwinism, and in specific, one name of an anthropologer, Otto Amon. Weber referred in this occasion to the social Darwinist positions of figures such as Otto Amon, and distanced himself from such views, not only because, and I quote, their questionable character with regards to methods and objective results, 
and can't represent the natural science, but also because, and here's not a quote, their political bias, especially their combination of social conservatism and free market dogmatism. There is a quote from the, the inaugural address from 1895, where Weber says, a mistake of most contribution, contributions coming from the natural science in terms of clarifying question of our science consists in the misguided ambition to refute socialism at all cost. In the fervor of this intent, the supposedly natural scientific theory of the social ordery, order involuntarily becomes an apology of the latter. Here then, in the first appearance of the name Nietzsche in Weber output, discounting two letters sent to Marianne in 1894, in which he only refers neutrally to reading him, in the first appearance of the name Nietzsche in Weber's output, so we observe the distance Weber establishes with the former, especially in light of conservative interpretation of that time. So what should be drawn from both instances of Nietzscheanism mentioned above, one direct towards Weber, one attributed by Weber to another thinker? It is possible to climb part of Nietzsche's work and publicly reject another. How to account for the fact that Nietzsche's name was associated with different political faction at the time? With this said, the problem and limitations surrounding the question of Weber Nietzschean character, or lack of therefore, become evident. The fact is that the absolute and dichotomous character that the question possesses, requiring a yes or no answer, does not allow us to apprehend the often contradictory character of historical forms of thought. Weber was able to appropriate certain concepts such as the notion of human types or ways of thinking, the ineluctability of struggle or the need to toughen up from Nietzsche's work and at the same time, separate himself from another aspects from or ways of reading it. Faced with these issues, it makes more sense to ask oneself about the multiple instances of influence, whether positive or negative, and dwell on their singularities, yet without the temptation to eventually add them to a coherent and harmonious whole. Hence, it's worth asking once again, but now in a better formulation, what are Nietzsche's influence on Max Weber? Thank you. Thank you so much, Octavio. I think we have a lot to discuss. And um, it's very fine that you used the last volume of the Max Weber Gesamtausgabe. And I think it's very exciting that Weber uses the term sozialpolitischer Nietzscheanismus. I think this is a very great and hard formulation. And maybe we discuss, discuss it later on. Now it's up to Christian. Christian Marti is an independent researcher, owner of a tutoring school in Switzerland, and so he is busy as a professional educator in Switzerland. And sometimes he is also a contributor of the famous newspaper Neue Zürcher. And in 2020, he published his dissertation on Max Weber, Ein Denker der Freiheit, which is now being published in the second edition. And we also have the uh, copy here <laughs> in Munich. And um, yes, thank you. Ah, that's much more better <laughs> to see it. Um, so Christian, it's up to you, uh, please. Uh, thanks, Edith, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks a lot also, Octavio, for this really nice speech. Uh, always when, I'm, when, I, uh, when I listen to the, to the Weberians from South America, like for example, also Victor Strazzeri, then I think they are the better Weberians therefore, than especially than the German. Uh, Weberians, because the, the South American Weberians, there are, they, they know what enthusiastic means. And in my opinion, the German guys, they are usually really uh, 
for example, not edit, that's clear, but the other ones, they are, they are sometimes a little bit lame. So Octavio, I really like what you, what you said about Max Weber. And thanks again, uh, Edith, for the introduction. Uh, that's true. I, I made my PhD about Max Weber, Ein Denker der Freiheit. Uh, and I did a lot of other things, for example, the tutoring school, or also a learning platform, which is a free learning platform for everyone. And we'll also be in South America next year, probably. So I think uh, Weber was a, a thinker also of education and that tried to bring this approach uh, to the whole world. Uh, so not only as re researcher, but also as an entrepreneur. Um, first, what I want to say is that I really, really agree, Octavio, that influence is a really difficult category. It's a really difficult category and people are talking too much about influence without really think about the word, in my opinion. So I also agree what Quentin Skinner said, that Quentin, Sk Quentin Skinner said all the time, uh, hey, uh, influence, you can't really talk about it because if one thinker is influenced by another, it's really hard to say. Probably also it's not possible to say if this is the case. So I really agree that we have to be really uh, vorsichtig uh, if we use this word. Uh, I like to talk about more, I like, I like more to use the word uh, uh, importance or meaning or Wichtigkeit or something like this. Is Nietzsche important for Max Weber? Has Nietzsche a meaning for Max Weber? I, I like to, to ask the question like this. I think for me then the question is a little bit clearer and also in my, in my PhD, I, I, I put the question like this. So, and the answer is also, I have more or less the same answer like you have. Yes, uh, Max, uh, Nietzsche is of importance for Max Weber. There are a lot of parts in Weber's work where he, where he speaks very positively about Nietzsche, but there are also a few parts where, she, where he speaks negatively uh, about Nietzsche. I have six examples I, I brought which are positive. First, uh, he talks about Nietzsche, Weber talks about Nietzsche, and he says that uh, he agrees that Glück, happiness, happiness, Glück, I don't know the English word exactly for it, but that happiness isn't really a goal in life. He agrees with Nietzsche, so this is like the first point where they are really together. And, and it's not just like this that Weber says, yeah, happiness, uh, es ist ein Brechmittel, something which makes you vomit. It's not only that they say the same. Uh, he says, I agree with Nietzsche that happiness is not a goal. So this is the first positive point I brought. The second positive point is the moral der Vornehmheit, the, the moral of nobility. Also there, he says with Nietzsche that the moral of nobility is really important. I wrote an essay about it in the journal, Berliner Journal für Soziologie. Uh, where, it's, uh, where I showed really detailed uh, with the help of Edith and the, the books behind Edith, especially with the uh, hand example of Max Weber from Simmel, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, where Weber writes in the, exactly, where Redi, Weber writes in the example, yes, yes, I agree, the moral der Vornehmheit is really important. The third example I brought is the will to power, Der Willen zur Macht. In, in, the, in the long essay about Parliament in, in, the, in the New Germany, I don't know the English title, in Parlament und Regierung im neu geordneten Deutschland, he, he quotes the will to power in a positive way. Then, and Weber says, yes, there's the will to power in the world. Everybody has the will to power and everybody wants to have this will. And if the, if the, if the left if the left intellectuals are saying there's no will to power, he rejects it. So it's, it's also there a positive point. The, the next positive point, number four I brought, is the, the, the theory of ressentiment, the ressentiment uh, theory in the introduction to the uh, relig uh, social, uh, religion sociology. But also a, a positive, uh, positive reading of Nietzsche. The next point or the last man, 
at the end of the Protestantische Ethik und Geisteskapitalismus, you know that, the, the really famous part where he, he says, diese letzten Menschen, uh, without spirit, uh, and so on. Uh, there's also a really positive, direct quote of Nietzsche. And the last point I brought, and this point is not really clear, uh, is the death of God. So Nietzsche's really famous statement that God is death, uh, you can't find it in Weber's text as exact in the same words like Nietzsche used it. You can't find it in the exact same words, but there are a, a, a few parts where Weber is talking about God from the Zeit, uh, a time which is far away from God, which we can probably interpret interpret the we can probably think that also okay this is this is also a point where he put Nietzsche and says yes Nietzsche is right but this is not really clear so I brought five points which are clear in my opinion if you read the texts of Max Weber they are totally clear in my opinion and one point I think it's 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 clear but we can discuss I brought also three points which are negative comments on Nietzsche the first is in the famous letter to Otto Gro to Else Jaffe, where, where Weber is talking about Otto Gross, where he says, ja, die, die biologischen Verbremungen Nietzsche's, uh, he, he criticizes, Weber criticizes the, the biological aspects of Nietzsche's theory. This is a negative point, a, a clear statement. The second point is in the book Edith showed two minutes ago, where uh, Weber is saying uh, with Simmel, yeah, yeah, Mark, uh, Nietzsche is a Spießer. Edith, what is a, what is a Spießer? A Spießer is like a lot of Germans are, but you are not. But a Spießer is? I don't know. Do we have someone who can translate it to English? It, it's impossible. Bigot. It's maybe Philistine or bigotry. Yes. Yeah. I think you know what I mean. So somebody which at the end hasn't a really open mind a little bit. It's, it's like a Kleinbürger, we can say also, but it's hard to say. But he, he, criticize, he criticizes Nietzsche for it. This is the second point. And the last point is, is also in the book uh, Edith brought, for example, in the last chapter, it's a book from Simmel about Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, and, and Weber comments a lot in this book, so, so he writes some stuff in it. And in the, especially in the last chapter, but not only there, also in other chapters, uh, Weber makes small comments where he criticizes a little bit what Nietzsche is saying. Some, most of the, of the comments are positive, yes, exactly, but some of them are also negative. So, and it's a long thing, you can analyze it, and, and Octavio, you find definitely a lot of interesting stuff in it for, for your PhD, but this is then also a negative point. So, and at the end, what I can say is um, that uh, I have the same answers like you, Octavio. I think, yes, you can say, yes, uh, Nietzsche is, it's a positive influence or no, it's a negative influence. That's also why I don't like the interpretation of Wolfgang Schluchter, for example. Uh, Wolfgang Schluchter, then I think, hey, this, uh, this really intelligent person wrote 60 years about Max Weber and then there's a clear no against uh, Nietzsche and then I, I can't understand it so I think the question is much more complicated and I really agree with you Octavio that uh, there are uh, it's a positive influence and sometimes also a negative influence and I would also say uh, uh, from, from the beginning on also the young Weber has this this uh, position towards Nietzsche, Nietzsche and the old Weber I think has more or less the same position of course some some things are changing that's clear it would be special if not uh, Max Weber was a really intelligent person. But I think in general, we can say that the position stays more or less the same during these uh, 30 years he was writing about stuff. Uh, so this is what I have to say. I, and again, Octavio, thanks a lot. And I hope there will be a nice discussion after it. And I'm also looking forward to the statement Camilla is giving Camilla, I, uh, I was, for my PhD, I was in Berlin and uh, with Hans Peter Müller, uh, the sociologist, and he also said, "Hey, there's this Camilla Emmenecker. You would really like her. Uh, she's a really intelligent, uh, good uh, researcher." So I'm really looking forward to it. 
Yes, thank you so much, Christian. I think you would have been a very good um, Schüler or um, successor of Wilhelm Nietzsche, my doctor father, because you share you mean, his you enthusiasm. Mean you mean Hennis? <laughs> yes, Wilhelm Hennis, so it is. Now, uh, thank you so much for listing up the positive and negative readings and motives Weber uses from Nietzsche. And now we are going to Camilla, Camilla Emmenegger is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Florence. And in 2020, she also finished her PhD thesis. And now I also quote the English title because it's written in Italian. It's World Revolution, Figures of Subjectivity in Max Weber between Ethical Radicalism and Political Violence. And in our library, we already have the manuscript of this book, and I hope it will be published maybe this year. So, <laughs> Camilla, it's a pleasure that you are here and that you will comment on Octavio and maybe also on Christian. <laughs> Thank you very much, Edith, for the presentation. I thank also Brenda and Victor for the organization of this event. Um, I read Octavio's paper with great interest, although it doesn't say much on what he thinks about the relationship between Weber and Nietzsche, so I would like to hear something more uh, specific from him today. Um, I liked his paper uh, for the same reason Christian already said, because it raises an important epistemological question. What do we mean when we say that an author has influenced another? Influence is indeed a problematic and discussed concept in the history of thought, and it is used to denote as much a, a common atmosphere as actual and explicit references. In our case, we also have one further issue, in my opinion. Weber doesn't say much about his own theoretical sources. With a few important exceptions, Weber does not make his position explicit with respect to the thinking of other authors. At the first superficial glance, it seems as if there are many similarities between Weber and Nietzsche's thoughts. The pessimistic diagnosis of modern times, the figure of the last man, the pluralism of values, the analysis of the impact of religion and many others. But of course, registering superficial similarities is not sufficient. So I agree with Octavio when he says that uh, we have to turn back to the texts and to look for actual matches in more detail. I, I have to admit that I had never dealt with uh, the actual influence of Nietzsche on Weber before, at least not in depth. So when I started reading the literature on this topic, I was surprised by the polarization of positions on this issue. There are those who claim an obvious Nietzscheanism of Weber, I am thinking about Eugen Fleischmann, for example, and on the other side, those who deny any consonance. I've just read a paper by Laurent Fleury, who denies any similarity. But of course, there are also those who tried to question the image of a Nietzschean Weber without dismissing the hypothesis of an actual influence. But still this influence can be understood in very different meanings. I do not think there is only one way to, to see the relationship between Nietzsche and Weber. And on this point, I agree with Klaus Lichtblau when he says that the relation of Weber and Nietzsche of Weber to Nietzsche is rather ambivalent and multi-layered. We can indeed find very different attitudes of Weber towards Nietzsche. I would like to propose one way among many of seeing this relation. Uh, as I said, I do not think it is the right one or the only one, but one possible among many others. You can take it as a suggestion for the discussion. It is a very unambitious and unpretentious way to understand it because it does not postulate any causal relationship of direct and actual influence of Nietzsche on Weber, something that uh, would require time and that maybe Octavio is doing for his research, but it merely records point of closeness and point of distance. 
I, I would like to explain it with two examples that I have taken from literature. I'll try to show how, for what concerns these two examples, we can find a strong thematic affinity, but an equally strong methodological divergence between Weber and Nietzsche. What I would like to argue is that in these two cases, Nietzsche and Weber share a lot in terms of topics and issues they deal with, but also that they diverge radically in the methodological approach they take to these same topics. The same topics are namely developed and approached in two very different methodological ways. In the first case I have chosen, Weber refers explicitly to Nietzsche. So we do not have to work on it too much. Weber is already telling us what he thinks about Nietzsche. Whereas in the second case, we do not have an, an explicit reference as far as I know. The first example has to do with Weber's sociology of religion. I picked it from a chapter by Ralph Schroeder included in a book called Max Weber, Rationality and Modernity and edited by Sam Wimster and Scott Lash. The chapter is called Nietzsche and Weber, Two Prophets of the Modern World. Uh, it is very recent. The publication dates back to 1987, but it is useful as a starting point. Schroeder claims a fundamental similarity between Nietzsche's and Weber's history of religion. He indeed finds deeper links in their analysis of the impact of religion and in their views of the historical development of this impact. According to Schroeder, Nietzsche and Weber share the same partition of the history of religions into three major phases. A primitive phase marked by pluralism of values and worldviews, which since they had not yet been subsumed under an all encompassing religious and ethical system, existed in a natural state of struggle or conflict. A second phase, dominated by universalistic religions, where a universal religious and ethical system takes the place of a pluralism of conflicting values. So where the competition between worldviews is replaced by monotheism and by an ethic of brotherly love. And then of course, a third phase, modernity and late modernity, characterized by a process of secularization, the loss of the hegemonic position of religion and the progressive disappearance of transcendental values, as well as by the re-emergence of a pluralism of values, which conflict reciprocally. Moreover, Weber and Nietzsche share also the fundamental idea that every religion is characterized by a specific relationship with the world. The idea, and in particular the concept of a Weltablenung de Religion, of a world rejecting religion, is already pre present in Schopenhauer. And as Stefan Breuer pointed out, he is the common source for Weber and Nietzsche. Despite these important thematic affinities on religion, of which I, gave, uh, I have given only a superficial overview by way of common reference, Nietzsche and Weber diverge radically in their methodological approach to it. We all know very well Weber's critique of Nietzsche's theory of resentment, the idea expressed in the first essay of his genealogy of morality that religion, and in particular the Christian morals, is the product of resentment of the weakest against life, so of a psychological condition that is rooted in material condition. As Weber writes in the introduction to the economic ethics of the world religions, and here is the explicit reference to Nietzsche I mentioned before, he agrees with Nietzsche that religion's transfiguration of the suffering can be colored by resentment, but he refuses to give to this statement the character of, un of a universal law. So maybe on this point, I do not agree uh, completely with Christian. He, Weber rejects resentment as a theory, he accepts it as an explanation of a singular specific phenomenon, in particular the emergence of Judaism, and rejects it as the explanation of religion as such. Uh, in this sense, Weber's critique to Nietzsche's theory of resentment is not a far cry from his critique to Marx. In both cases, he refuses to see religion and intellectual phenomena in general as a simple function of material conditions. Nietzschean psychology, is only another form of materialism, which traces back cultural and intellectual phenomena to material condition, seeing them as the only true determinant factor in history. So although Weber's and Nietzsche's 
conceptions of religion have a lot in common, they diverge completely in what concerns a fundamental methodological issue. Uh, now I would like to, to consider the second example, which has to do with Weber's sociology of domination and which is also taken from the literature. Uh, scholars, Schroeder again, but also Wolfgang Mommsen and Wilhelm Hennis, for example, underline quite frequently the similarity between the Nietzschean conception of a superman or in Gianni Vattimo's and Walter Kaufmann's translation Overman and the Weberian charismatic leader. The link is found in two main aspects that characterize both the Nietzschean superman and the charismatic leader. First of all, the revolutionary and destructive dimension. Both figures stand against tradition and rule, destroying all values and norms. According to Weber, charisma is revolutionary insofar as it opposes the authority of the eternal yesterday, what has always been and is therefore considered customary or even sacred. Charisma, I'm quoting Weber here, in its supreme phenomenal form breaks the rules and tradition in general, even subverting every concept of sacredness. In order to explain the revolutionary character of charisma, Weber uses a very Nietzschean word, umwertend. The charismatic power is revolutionary, all transvaluing, umwertend, and breaking with every traditional or rational norm. It is written, but I say unto you. Moreover, and this is the second similarity, charismatic leader and Superman share also another aspect. They not only destroy old values, but they also build new ones. And this is the proper meaning of the Nietzschean expression, umwertung alle Werte, the replacement of old values with new ones. Weberian charisma is indeed radically innovative because it produces from scratch a new set of values, uh, beliefs, norms, in opposition to the existing ones. Both the genuine prophet and the every authentic leader creates and promotes new precepts. The transvaluation of old values is the action of one person. In Nietzschean words, it is the product of his own will to power. In Weberian words, of his ability to produce a metanoia, an inner conversion in other people who follow him and recognize him, his power. Although we can find many particular differences between these two figures, one among many, whereas the charismatic leader refers to other worldly values, the Superman refuses any reference to transcendence. I think that the main difference between the two has to do again with their different, different methodological functions. The Superman is for Nietzsche a normative ideal, someone who has to come. Zarathustra pro prophesizes the arrival of a Superman. So that the title of Schroeder's paper, Nietzsche and Weber Prophets of the New of the Modern World, fits for Nietzsche, but I think not for Weber. Weber indeed does not prophesize anything. The charismatic leader is not a normative ideal for him, but an ideal type, a, a theoretical object which serves to analyze and to understand different form, forms of power in history. If we want to find a normative ideal for Weber, we have to look at his concept of, uh, sorry, at his concept of Persönlichkeit, which is however, and still, not an, ob an object of prophecy for Veda. Uh, on the other side, and I would like to uh, be clear on this, Weberian arguments uh, in favor of the advent of the charismatic leader in post-war Germany, and thus the arguments in favor of so-called plebiscitary democracy, occupy a peculiar position in Weber's political reflection and can only be understood from the specific historical and social situation of a post-war Germany in the midst of a revolutionary crisis. Charismatic leadership embodied by a Reich president elected by the people represented for Weber at that time the best institutional solution for the crisis of legitimacy of traditional powers caused by the war and the revolution. With these two examples I picked from, lit from literature, I wanted to propose, and I'm about to conclude, the idea that a possible and very, very general way to understand the theoretical relationship between Nietzsche and Weber might, might be that one of a thematic affinity and a methodological divergence. They share many important theoretical issues, but they place them within very different epistemological perspectives. This difference might be rooted in their contrasting views on the possibility of objectivity in science 
and in particular in social science, whereas Nietzsche refuses it, understanding his per perspectivism as uh, even if active nihilism, Weber tries to preserve it. Even if he accepts Nietzsche perspectivist premises, he tries to maintain the possibility of an objective social science and understands his theoretical concepts as research tools. Uh, I hope I have provided uh, material for the discussion and I look forward to hearing Octavio's opinion, uh, who is our expert here, uh, on how he has understood the relation between Weber and Nietzsche and how uh, he has developed this very interesting topic. Many thanks, uh, Camilla, for this very um, dense and reflected um, paper or your comments, um, which touch the main spheres of Weber's work. That means religion as a big issue and uh, political science and domination. But first of all, it's up to you, Octavio. Do you have anything to comment on the both statements yes yes i will say something uh, first of all uh, thanks both of you I, I i love your exposition perhaps now i, I will say uh, some critics but because it's more like funny for all if we discuss and not be all together no it's not like sean lennon imagine but um one thing that it's truth and i think that christian camille uh, uh, marked that my text is a very tricky text because i don't say nothing about nietzsche and Weber relationship and that's uh, i don't know why uh, i have i made my master thesis uh, about that but i am more confused than uh, in that moment about the topic so i wanted to uh, more to hear that saying, but now I, I need to say something. Um, I have some question to Christian. I am not very sure that this, uh, that the concept of importance had less problems than influence. I, I think that they are uh, like synonyms. So the, the same problem that we have with the concept of influence, we have it with the importance. Uh, I, I, I was, and I am, a Skinnerian. I love Quentin Skinner writings. I think that his uh, writings about the concept of influence are very sceptical ones. And he also said that in some, in the reedition of uh, meaning and understanding from Vision of Politics in 2002. Uh, I, I wrote a text about how to study influence that will be published in the next month in a, a um, magazine no review no how it's called in english uh like a, a scientific journal uh, in argentina uh, so I, I i think that it's the same there's a question I, I want to hear you which are the 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 advantages of the concept of importance that does the influence that don't have i think uh, in that moment i have like an intuition like we know all, I think that uh, the, the concept of influencers, like from internet, like they are important people. No, they are something that in, in, the, in the sense of what people thought, not, not what I think, but there is something in, like related between uh, influence and importance. Uh, what more? Uh, yeah, I want to hear you, Christian, and also Camille, because I, in my, all my research about MacBever stop, stops in 1910. I don't know almost nothing about Max Bever in the last uh, part of his life. Uh, obviously it's a polemical decision, uh, conscious from my, my, my part. And, but uh, obviously I read some stuff about that and I read Bever, but I don't uh, make a serious research. And I'm very interested in this question of moral of nobility that appears in, I don't want to say it wrong, Wahlrecht uh, und Demokratie in Deutschland, a uh, text of 1917, if I 
don't be wrong, that I think that had something in common of both of your presentation, because they, it, they are, it is for one side, a positive influence of Nietzsche, the idea of Ponemheit or nobility, the importance of nobility, the importance of the uh, path of their distance from the leader to, and here it's uh, near from Camila, I'd say about the Superman or the, the link between Superman and, and leadership. But they are, for me, better established, established the, the more furious critic to Nietzsche or, or better, for certain Nietzscheans from his time, but is the relation between von Nemheit or nobility and uh, demo uh, democracy and the masses. That in Nietzsche, they are completely antagonic. It's uh, for the existence of the Superman, there is no way that uh, can uh, live in peace with democracy for Nietzsche. So I want to hear from you because it's one of my favorite subjects and one of the subjects that I don't work because it was out of my temporal decision. Um, what I, uh. I, I mean, the, 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 que the question you put first was the importance, how is it different than, uh, than uh, influence? And to be honest, I'm not a methodologist, so I, 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 I can't answer this question in this short time precisely. But I think that the category of influence has traditional wise. In tradition, it means a, it, it's a little bit brighter than importance. If, if somebody hears influence, then if he thoughts to usually he or she thought, starts to think of the yeah, and, and this influence I think is also there and yeah there's yeah it could be I think there's an influence yes right because influence can be more or less everything and we, in in my personal understanding importance then on the other hand is a little bit more precise but this is only my personal understanding and and that's why it's not really clear and in an objective way but but then you have to if somebody in which way he was important for Weber. Then we start to think about which part Weber writes something about Nietzsche and what exactly does he write uh, this about Nietzsche and how important is the thing he writes about Nietzsche. And we are probably on a level which is a little bit more precise. But to be honest, this is not a, a, a really good answer, but we can probably stay in contact by email, then we can discuss a little bit pre more precise about it. But this is, in my personal understanding, influence is brighter and wider than importance, in my opinion. And the moral de Vornehmheit, Camilo uh, is, knows definitely more about it than I do, I think. Yes, I would like to say some things about the, both of the topics you raised. Um, I, I agree with Christian that maybe importance as concept can be, so for me is uh, useful than, than influence uh, because in, influence in a way uh, implies the idea of a, a causal relationship. Uh, someone has influenced another, uh, whereas importance has something to do with um, just thoughts. So maybe it's, for me, it's less precise than influence, but influence between thoughts uh, is, too, is too much. We, can, we cannot, um, it, for me, it's very difficult to, to speak about influence because you are implying um, a causal relationship in a way. And on the, other, on the other issue you raised, I think, yeah, I agree with you. So um, Weber and Nietzsche, uh, are very different on this on this topic because for Nietzsche, um, no, nobility so the, the few um, stand against the masses, and we all know that. Whereas for Weber, um, the nobility of the few can uh, be able to raise uh, the masses to improve them. So there is a. Um, more strict relation and not not an opposition between them and you can see that also in what Weber writes about the uh, bourgeoisie the German bourgeoisie so the, the the dominant class 
has a role, have a function in the whole society. So they are the few, uh, they have a different, they can have a different morality, but they have also a function in the whole system and also uh, towards the masses. So I think they, they really have uh, two opposite positions on this uh, topic. Uh, right. I um, I know I, I prefer to hear the, the other people and then uh, speak again. I'm Okay. Um, shall we open the floor for the other participants? I think we have two major complexes. The one is the methodological question, how can we uh, characterize this relationship? Um, I would like to add one more category. Uh, I like the translation from Key's tribe of Hennis a contribution, the traces of Nietzsche in the work of Max Weber, who spoke about a tuning. There is a specific sound in Weber's work that sounds very Nietzschean. So this is not identical, but the kind he chooses, the topics, the critics of culture, and also the perspective to uh, criticize the own society with the same, yes, tuning or sound as Nietzsche does it. This is the one complex and the other complex, I think, which is very important even for the Nietzsche reception in Germany in um, 1933 and after on is the question what happens if we interpret Nietzsche in a racist and social Darwinist kind and uh, anti-democratic kind, what happens then? That is, I think, the danger in Nietzsche and Nietzscheanism if it becomes politically adopted and maybe a little bit changed also. But now it's up to all the participants who wants to comment or pose a question. Please raise your hand or use the symbol for raising the hand. So we have Yanis Ktenas. Yes. Hi, thank you, Victor. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank very much uh, and congratulate also Octavio, but also Christian and Camilla. Um, I learned a lot, and um, every time I uh, participate in such a meeting of uh, Weber Scholars Network, it's like uh, having uh, studied for many, many hours. So um, I would like to um pick three small um points to offer to the uh conversation and perhaps pose some questions uh, to octavia but also to christian and camilla uh first first of all uh, i would like to say that um i share octavio's um agony towards the the concept of uh, influence because it, in my uh, dissertation, it was vice versa. I had to study the influence of Weber to a younger philosopher, uh, the, the Greek French philosopher Cornelius Castoriadis. And there, again, we had the same issues. Uh, what does influence mean, etc. But now to some um, uh, uh, points regarding the uh, uh, um, um, context. First of all, I was really impressed by what uh, Octavio has recently found, uh, found in, the, in this uh, new edition, uh, because uh, I learned that Weber criticizes a, a, so, a sort of social Darwinism, uh, if, I, uh, if I got it uh, correctly, uh, because um, uh, that is just a thought, 
but I think that uh, in some of uh, Weber's writings, we can also um, hear a Dar Darwinian uh, tune, to use Edith's uh, uh, phrase. For example, in the famous inaugural, inaugural uh, uh, lecture, right, in Freiburg, we have this um, term of Kampf um Dasein, the struggle for existence, that comes again and again. And uh, I think that uh, while this is probably uh, Darwinian, it also is kind of, uh, we could say, uh, with some interpretation, that it's quite close to Nietzsche, this thing, because it is exactly, uh, Weber uh, le le uh, later on abandons the uh, Darwinian connotations, but uh, this fundamental idea that uh, there is a fundamental conflict, life is a struggle, there is a, a, an irreducible conflict, uh, remains. And um, I would like to see how it resonates to both uh, Darwin and Nietzsche. Uh, then second, secondly, um, I really liked what uh, Camilla said uh, regarding um, the um, uh, uh, methodological diversity and the but the thematic affinity and I would I wanted to add regarding what she said uh, on uh, the resentment uh, theory of Nietzsche that uh, Weber says uh, res exactly resentment can uh, perhaps explain uh, the genesis of uh, Judaism but it has nothing to do with Buddhism resentment. Can, uh, has nothing to do with Buddhism, it cannot explain Buddhism. So, uh, and the, it is exa exactly what Camilla said, there are no universal principles. It's the same critique as against uh, uh, Marx. Uh, but then, um, uh, I would um, also like to uh, point out some um, affinities because I had read in a, a book by Katrin Coyote-Len that uh, leaving a lecture, uh, Weber said to Oswald Spengler, you know, there are two writers uh, <laughs> without wits, we cannot work these days, and if we do not ac uh, accept it, we fool ourselves and we fool others, Marx and uh, Nietzsche. So, um, in the topic of value polytheism, uh, Camilla said some things about it, um, Weber directly quotes, quotes um, Nietzsche along with Baudelaire along with Baudelaire. And then there, uh, there we have uh, this uh, strong uh, connection. And I would, but, but then again, on the topic of truth and um, objectivity in social sciences, et cetera, uh, Camille, I think is right, they, they, they diverge again. So I would like to ask Octavio and Kristen and Camilla, what would they, they think uh, regarding this interpretation? We have um, uh, Weber, who is quite Nietzsche regarding the socio-political and ethico-political values, but then not on the, on the topic of um, objectivity. Because the famous uh, phrase of Nietzsche, there, is no, there are no facts, there are all, all only interpretations, Weber would not accept this thing. The perspectivism, Exists in Weber's also methodological writings, as he famously uh, said it. In facts themselves, there is, as Goethe used to say, theory. Inside a, a, a fact, there is also theory. But still, he believes that there is, uh, when we have a sufficiency of um, empirical data, etc., 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 we can say there are some facts. Uh, in, so, uh, what and this, uh, and, and I want to stop here, is uh, for Weber the acknowledgement of facts, uh, a sort of intellectuelle Rechtsaffenheit. And Rechtsaffenheit, uh, that is bizarre or not, is also a term of, me, of Nietzsche, the, the Rechtsaffenheit. Uh, so these were my my thoughts. Thank you all all of you very much. And I would also like to hear your um, thoughts regarding this uh, value perspectivism, but not uh, the acceptance of uh, there are only interpretation, not uh, facts at all. Thank you very much.
Is there anyone else? Or Camilla, do you like to uh, repeat to uh, Yanis? Thank you, Yanis, <laughs> for your contribution. Do I reply? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Camilla. Yeah. Please, please go. I can I can speak later. It's just to to add to. I wanted to read this quote uh, because now, especially with this audience, I want to know what you guys think about the authenticity or how much we can rely on this quote, which is similar to what uh, Yaris mentioned with regards to Spengler. I know this from Edward Baumgartner. Uh, we have this famous quote, um, and I, I read here from from Fleeing the Iron Cage from Lawrence Gaff or for his from his translation of it. So quote. Can judge the honesty of a contemporary scholar and above all a contemporary philosopher according to how he takes a stand in relation to Nietzsche and Marx. Whoever denies that he could not have accomplished the most important parts of his work without the work done by both of them deceives himself and others. The world in which we live as intellectuals being intellectual beings is largely a, a world bearing the imprint of Marx and Nietzsche. And I ask you, I mean, how much should we vet, should we consider this this you know this quote? It's not even a quote, it's indirect kind of statement that we got that we get through Baumgarten. And not only because the question of influence is here again, and this time uh, from, directly from the horse's mouth, directly from Weber, or indirectly, but let's say if he did say this, then he's, treat, he's talking about an influence as well. And there's one point of it, if it is in fact him, or if we should trust this, this quote, is that he talks about influence in the active voice. So he says, uh, we can judge the honesty of, of a contemporary scholar through this to how they uh, take a stand in relation to Nietzsche and Marx. So it's a very, so influence here is very much, if we, or, or importance in this case, is very much an active relationship of the thinker to the others, uh, other, you know, his previous, his or his or her predecessors. And of course, this, the authenticity of this world or its relevance is important to me because if, you know, the other half of the quote is, uh, has has made me it's, it's basically the, the the core of my research. So, what's the relationship with the Marx? But that that one will leave for another meeting. So, just to add this uh, this question about the Baum the Baumgart uh, quote. Thank you. Who wants to answer to this? Maybe. Octavio or Christian? <laughs> I think that uh, Camila wants to say something and then I can speak as Camila. Okay, thank you. No, I, um, I, I was, uh, so I, I agree with, with Yanis. So I, I think we, uh, we just say the same about this, um, this problem of objectivity. Um, I, I wanted to say some, something what, uh, to what Victor said now. So um, I, I have no idea about the authenticity, of course, of this quotation. Uh, but um, yes, so I think uh, I read this quotation as if Weber um, okay. is saying us. Um, so of course, he was profoundly marked by Marx and Nietzsche, and it was somehow inevitable to engage with them. Um, but on the other side, he was as little a Nietzschean as he was a Marxist. But what, what I read from this quotation is that he's also saying that um, there are scholars who are immersed in, Weber, in Nietzsche and Marx thought but they don't say anything. They don't. Um, they yeah. They don't say. Uh, they don't. They don't quote, for example, uh, Marx and Nietzsche. So the, the the question about the 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 honesty of saying that Marx and Nietzsche are important. I I I read it polemically. So he's saying to someone other that maybe it's a, it's better to to admit that that they are so important and that a scholar at that time uh, has to engage with them in a way. So I, I read it in this way. 
All right, I, I um I will I want to say I want to say some stuff uh, regarding Janis, but also something that I, I hadn't said from Christian and Camila. Um, one thing before I forget uh, to Camila that for me was very interest, uh, interesting. When I was now I'm I'm doing my I'm almost finishing my PhD uh, in these weeks. I will send my thesis. And it's not about Nietzsche, Nietzsche is gone. It's only about uh, the economy or the, the, the economic aspects of the thinking of Weber between 1892 uh, and uh, 1910. And in the discussions um, after the publication of the Protestant ethic, it's a great discussion that have Weber where the, the concept of Übermensch appears but in a methodological way, I, I say, and I think that is some, something interesting for you perhaps, because there are, um, some of the critics of Weber says, wait, there, in all time, there were men who seek um, rich, richness, richness, or, or they, they were like seekers of gold. And Weber said there, I don't interest myself for the economic you've mentioned, or the su economic superman. And uh, for my investigation, the, the concept of human typus or typus menschlichkeit or the human type that is for me is fundamental for Weber and that he took from Nietzsche. But we here have a, a, a really interesting difference between which human type is the uh, relevant to study. The Juvenmans, this in the, the um, the rare examples of human type or the normal human type or the general human type. And for Weber, it's not the, you've mentioned what is interesting to study, for example, in the Protestant ethic, but the general human types. And there, I think that it's something interesting that I haven't read uh, about uh, and nothing, it's like a disclaimer. Uh, then uh, I want to say uh, to Shanice, Something that for me also was a, a very interesting and um, like uh, difficult point that it's social Darwinism and, and Weber. And here we have the same problem with uh, the question of Nietzscheanism. I, I have read a lot. I, I devoted myself to the young Max Weber. Um, so I, I faced one and one and a thousand of times with the idea that Weber is a social Darwinist when young. It's like a, a common opinion. Not today, perhaps it's more like uh, complex, but it was in a moment a, a common opinion. And that because he used a lot of concepts that comes from the work of Darwin, like comes in the sense like struggle of existence, selection, breed, uh, but again, when we ask about social Darwinism of Weber, from which concept of social Darwinism we are asking? And a lot of time it was like a, a, a rare bug, no, like not very presently concept of social Darwinism and at worst, not an historical situated concept of social Darwinism. We don't need to go with our concept of social Darwinism when Max Weber knew, not knew, yeah, the, and, was in relation with and um, the writings of social Darwinists of that time. That obviously they are not the same. They are they exist. They are not exist one social Darwinism. But I think that uh, in the uh, in the last volume of the Max Weber Gesamtausgabe, the the lectures of uh, politic uh, practice practice ah. But this economy, there's a lot of information, very important because it's like, for me, it's like if we have the inaugural address lecture and we have a, how do you say in English? Uh, lupa is in Espanol, like. Wait, yes. Magnifying glass, magnifying glass. Magnifying glass, yeah. And we have like a lot of explanation that they are in the inaugural address, very summarized and with the distance of the time, very misleading for us. Uh, uh, in, in the question of social Darwinism, and he, in it, it's like very clear that for me, 
Weber is not a social Darwin, and he was intentionally and polemic, polemically uses the word of social Darwinism discussion because it was the word of his time. But in a, he most of this concept give it like uh, the in a in a opposite opposite uh, sense. And here also was very important for me, like the discursive communities where the word of and the work of Darwin was reading and was well, what was reading um, Weber, where the name of Friedrich Lange is very important because Friedrich Lange have a specific interpretation of Darwin that is not biologicist and is not teleological in, in his aspect of the selection that Simmel in uh, the Soziale Differenzierung from uh, it's like uh, from early 1890s also took from Lange. The, the lecture that Lange makes from Darwin, it's in Simmel and it's in the lectures in the bibliography that Weber has in his own lectures. So I think that is another very interesting uh, theme and very polemical one from which is not very much written, I think. Um, uh, and perhaps because I, I managed myself to reach at this hour without saying nothing about the influence of Nietzsche and Weber, uh, perhaps it's time that I say something. And I say, I, I will say that it's very important in Weber, like I think that Weber is always aware of the context of his intervention, he does he do not have a, a really direction a, a relation with his work, like and with I don't know his writing, but always pay attention to what it's saying about this topic in this context. And this with Nietzsche is very important because the the most of the critics as Weber makes to Nietzsche, not all, but the, uh, and in a specific, the political ones and not the methodological ones. His problem is more with the Nietzsche's interpretation of his times and not necessarily with Nietzsche because we know Nietzsche could be read it from different points of view. And, and the, the same happens with the political positions of Weber. And Weber, he never would rewrite him, never, I don't know how to use conditional, so, but uh, for example, a book uh, as the Leviathan of Hobbes, like a, a very theoretical book because it's a nonsense for Weber who knows that all his intervention was situated in one time and one context, but that also give us like the question of, okay, but what is under the surface of all these interventions? So I think that if we want to know uh, how were the, influence, the influences of Nietzsche and Weber, we must, yes, go one by one in, in like uh, different times and seeing what was saying the people in that time about Nietzsche, what was saying the people uh, near to him in that uh, instance. For example, and uh, Edith sent us a, a, a article from, uh, Hugh Schreiber, nine. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't remember. But there, there are names so imp uh, very important from Weber, like for example, Frederick Albert Lange or Alois Riel, that today for us they sound nothing because they are not philosophers that perhaps have reached the influence uh, in the uh, 20th century, but they are crucial to understand what is Weber really Nietzsche. Uh, perhaps it's a, a task very difficult and with uh, which result and importance of his result is arguable. It's not clear that it's relevant to make such an historical investigation. But in this point, I think that I, via a little like um, archivistic or uh, I think that 
it's not to be funny, perhaps a, a, a serious research and, and perhaps one might, I have wrote a thesis of 2000 pages and uh, at the end I can say not much. Uh, uh, but I think that it's the most uh, honest I, I can make. And, and here it comes, but I think that also Janice says, like the inte intellectual probity that both Nietzsche Weber and I, that I am influenced from both have. I will finish here. Thank you. Um, maybe Christian has something to say to the um, very famous indirect quotation. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's really, it's, I love this topic, the Nietzsche uh, Weber relationship, better said uh, the relationship from Weber to Nietzsche. But uh, I think it's a hard topic and I think there aren't really correct answers or not correct answers. But what's really clear, or let's say they're wrong, the answers which are definitely wrong or these, which are saying, yes, Weber was totally a, a Nietzschean, or no, he has nothing to do with Nietzschean. I think this is really what we can say at the end. And, and for us as young researchers, I would say that it's important, just as Octavio mentioned, to look at different parts of the Weberian works, at different parts. And in each of these parts, we have to, to, to find out is there an influence or an importance for Weber from Nietzsche? This is really, I think it's an ongoing research here. And also in this case, discussion, I had so many oh. ideas. I had so many ideas to make an- Ti uh, posso in cinque minuti? Sì. Uh, I, I had so many ideas, which, which could be, which, which are possible to, to write about. So I think, I hope there, there's another question, another session about this topic or about the Weber Marx relationship would be also great, Victor. Uh, probably or you organize also stuff like this. It would be as interesting and as important as this discussion, I guess. So um, I think we have to come to an end. Is this right? <laughs> um, does any one of you? like to pose a very last question or ah there is nicolas yes thank you first of all thank you for the organization and congratulations to the lecturers it was very interesting i'm not a beba fosha or a Nietzsche fosha but i would like to ask something which can be answered by octavio camilla or christian i would like to know how much important was Nietzsche when Weber wrote these essays in which we could reach this influence relationship. Can we consider that Nietzsche was already a classical German philosopher like Kant or Hegel or not? How was Nietzsche considered by Weber contemporaries, for example? I think that this is important because all German philosophers or German thinkers have read Kant or Hegel, but maybe by the beginning of the 20th century, Nietzsche was not a must for social scientists. So that's all. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, who wants to answer to Nicholas, maybe? What's the relevance of Nietzsche compared with the classical German philosophers at the end of the 19th century? Maybe a very short answer given by Christian. <laughs> Yes, I, I have a, because I really, I had, a, I bought a few weeks ago, I bought the whole, uh, you know, this Zeitschrift für Kulturphilosophie edit, the Zeitschrift für Kultur, the Logos. It's a really famous journal. And I went through all the Logos. I didn't read all of them, but in every Logos journal, and there are 20 of them, I guess, I read two or three essays. And really in nearly every essay, Nietzsche is so important. I couldn't believe it. There's an essay from a thinker I never heard about that he was talking about uh, Nietzsche. Another essay from Simmel, he was talking about Nietzsche. Another essay from, I don't know who, he was writing about Nietzsche. And I thought, how is it possible that already in 1910, Nietzsche is definitely, in my opinion, much more important than, for example, Kant. 
is also a really famous quote from Max Weber. He says, oh, these women left the man, they broke up. And then Weber was saying, yes, yes, I know the reason. Uh, this man loved Kant and everybody who loves Kant, they are so lame. What do you want to do with them? It's clear that the woman is going away from him. And of course, the, the thing which Nietzsche was different, Nietzsche is not lame, he's interesting in this uh, field. So I think really Nietzsche in this field is for Max Weber, but for, for a lot, a lot of other things really, really important. Okay, I think this was a very good <laughs> um, finishing word. Uh, so thank you very much to Octavio, Camilla, Christian, but also to Brenda and Victor for organizing this uh, talk. And now I want to um, ask Victor whether we have any announcement for the next meeting and what is your plan? Uh, not yet. We have a few things planned, uh, and we'll, we'll we'll be in touch with you guys through the network as soon as possible. But we don't have the next stock is not scheduled yet, though a few are in the works. So just check out the the website uh, VaporScores.net and and our uh, um, social media pages, and and we'll let you know. But other than that, uh, if you're interested in participating, we're going to be doing one of these. Uh, one of this every month, maybe, um, always with different participants from all around the world, which uh, which are part of our network, network already. If you want to join or if you know anyone who would like to join, you don't have to be a Weberologist. You, uh, the idea is to have or be influenced by Weber. Uh, <laughs> the idea is that you engage with him in some manner and you find his work still to be relevant or you want you like to discuss it. So yeah, from 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 myself, uh, also thanks to, to our participants, to Octavio for uh, for that, you know, the great text he, he produced, and we've been working on this for, for a few months. And to, to Christian and to Camilla and to Edith for, for hosting and to Brenda for making this all possible from the from the organizational side. So I guess thanks, thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, see you next time.